<sighs> All right, I think we'll go ahead and get started. Um, good evening, everybody. Welcome to the Hudson Library and Historical Society's live event with Lana Wood. She is the author of Little Sister, my investigation into the mysterious death of Natalie Wood. Before we get started, I wanna let you know that next week we have two author programs on tap for you. Terrence Smith will discuss his book, Four Wars, Five Presidents, A Reporter's Journey from Jerusalem to Saigon to the White House on Tuesday at 7 p.m. And Nancy Goldstone will join us to talk about her book, In the Shadow of the Empress, the Defiant Lives of Maria Theresa, Mother of Marie Antoinette and Her Daughters, and that's on Thursday at 7. You can learn all about and register for all of our programs at hudsonlibrary.org. A reminder that if you're joining us on Zoom, feel free to put your questions for Lana in the Q&A at the bottom of your screen. Also, the Learned Owl, our local independent bookstore, is selling copies of tonight's book, and there's a link in the chat if you'd like to purchase one. Tonight, I am delighted to welcome actress Lana Wood. She is also an author and a producer, and um, she started her acting career in John Ford's classic, The Searchers, in 1956 as a younger version of her sister Natalie's character. She later earned a contract with 20th Century Fox and is perhaps best known for playing Sandy Weber on the TV series, Peyton Place, and Plenty O'Toole in the James Bond film, Diamonds Are Forever. In addition to the book we're discussing tonight, Lana also wrote Natalie Wood, a memoir of her sisters. Sister, excuse me. <laughs> Lana, welcome. Thank so, you. We are so excited to have you here tonight. And um, I know that um, we have lots of people with who probably have lots of questions, but I think we're going to just start with a little discussion, you and I. Okay. Um, <laughs> that's all right. Um, like your sister, Natalie, as I just said, you've, you've had a long career in um, Hollywood. And um, I we're wondering, um, you know, looking back on those years, uh, what was it like? And um, do you have any particularly fond memories from that time in your life? Oh, I have dozens and dozens of fond memories because when you start a show, um, everybody's new, you're chatting and, and, enjoying those people that you'll be working with and um you know a new director um it's it, i have i've worked with some wonderful people um jack lemon was my father once um walter Matthau was my father um i just you know some really lovely people and uh i've made a lot of friends i worked with richard dreyfus um i could go on and on and on <laughs> i'm um, sure when Peyton Place uh, stopped and um, I was basically written out at the end, they couldn't figure out what the heck to do with poor Sandy. Um, <laughs> and poor Sandy and poor Plenty has uh, stuck with me. Um, anyway, they started loaning me to different shows. So I did every TV show known to mankind. So it was, uh, it was a lot of fun. It was really a lot of fun. I mean, is there is there any one memory that really stands out or sticks out or, or somebody <laughs> you work with that, you know, you just, just something that's really special or? Working with, um, on QB7 meant a great deal to me. Uh, I even lost a very influential agency over that because they didn't want me to do it because it was only one scene but it was with Ben Gazzara and Juliet Mills and Anthony Hopkins. And I so wanted to be a, a part of that. It meant a great deal to me. And working with Ben Gazzara, he, it could not have been lovelier. I mean, he's a very giving, very talented actor. And it was, it was really nice. And, and uh, when I was walking off the stage after that first and only day, the, uh, the director yelled out at me, said, wait a minute, wait a minute. And I, I stopped and he said, I'm putting you up for an Emmy for this wow. performance. Wow. So the entire experience on QB7 meant a, a great deal to me. It really did. 
That's that's amazing. That's really cool. Now you you were obviously quite young when you were doing these shows. Um, were you starstruck? I mean, working no. with all these people that were famous, or 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 not? These yeah. are all people that acted for a living. Most of them I knew beforehand. Mm -hmm. uh, Bob Conrad um, from Wild Wild West was a family friend. Um, various people like that. No, I, I they were just working. Mm -hmm. actors and I appreciated their talent some were more interesting than others right. but uh, no it's difficult to be starstruck when you were raised on a set and that's, that's true. all that is... I had ever seen right because you were on set with Natalie when mm -hmm. you were very young so right to you that was probably just a second home right it's just what you did yeah what you did yeah yeah so so it, getting into acting for you was just it was like a family business Right. I mean, well, my mom started putting me in for roles. Um, I did a lot of TV and a lot of live TV when I was a child. Um, and then when I got to be around 13, 14, I rebelled mm -hmm. because I was really tired of being pointed at, being teased. Um, even teachers were saying rude things about me to the class. Um, it was really funny, but I did, I just didn't want to work anymore. I wanted to keep that small circle of friends. I wanted to go to football games. Um, I wanted to smoke in the ladies room. I want to do all those, all those things that you're supposed to do. Um, so I ran away from home. Mm -hmm. I called Natalie and I went to live with her for a couple of weeks until she sorted out my mom. And, um, I remember that I took a job in a clothing store and Neil McQueen, Steve McQueen's wife came in and said, what are you doing here? And I said, I'm working. And she said, well, she said, I, I don't want you to do this anymore. She said that her friend Leo Penn was directing an episode of uh, Dr. Kildare. And she said, I want you to go and read for it and get this part. And I said, now I don't know how I feel about it. And I stepped away from acting and, you know, I've really been fine. And she said, nope, you're going. And she called later at the store and said, you have an appointment on such and such a day. Call it sick. And you're going to this. She was very insistent. So I went, I got the role. And um, the whole thing was they needed someone who looked 14 but was over 18 so that they could work her all day instead of the strange kid hours. So um, that was in my favor as well. Um, but I remember walking off the stage and going to my car and thinking, this is what I really like. This is what I love to do. But I wanted it to be my choice. And I wanted to know that that's what I really wanted because it's tough. You know, it's, it's a hard hard life it's a hard career and um if you're not willing to go in and and be brave and be tough you're not going to get along too well yeah that makes perfect sense i mean mm -hmm. you, we all have a right to choose what we want to do with our lives and absolutely you know you you were i guess lucky that that opportunity came along when it did and helped yeah. you out with that. Yeah. So before mm -hmm. we get it heavily, I mean, I know you, you did talk about all of that in the book, but before we get further in the book, I did want to ask that about your writing, you um, obviously writing has been a part of your life. Um, mm -hmm. you talk about writing, having written poems. And um, of course you wrote an, another book prior to this. Um, tell us about your writing. Like, has it been always been a big part of your life for real? Um, what does it mean well, to you? Books and my absolute adoration of writers in general um, were always part of my life. I actually began writing um, little golden books. I don't know if you know what those were. Oh, I but, oh absolutely. <laughs> okay, but that's what I was sort of, that's what I was into it. And I began writing stories that I hoped would be uh, turned into a little golden book, but None of them were ever accepted, but uh, yes, I've always, I've always enjoyed writing 
Mm -hmm. always yeah and is it isn't an out do you consider it like an outlet for you for you or it's just a hobby yes it's not a hobby obviously but yes it it can be mm -hmm. um I remember writing you know half of a a book of poetry while I was on board a plane going back to the United States and feeling very conflicted and I just began writing and um so that uh, that book I did finish as well. Oh, that's wonderful! I that's really for, for, warms the librarian's heart here. <laughs> <laughs> um, so to the to the point of this book that we're talking about, which by the way I wanted to make sure everybody sees this is this is Lana's <laughs> book. It is in the stores now, and if you haven't yet read it, it's a great read and it's very interesting, and I do highly recommend it. Um, so why did you decide to write this book and why now? Because it seemed to me that there was articles that would slip out, shows, specials, uh, various things about Natalie and about her death. And they were offensive and they were cruel as far as I was concerned to Natalie. And suddenly I, I saw the time slipping away and nobody had Natalie's back. Nobody said, wait a minute, let's protect this person and let's make sure that people know truthfully about Natalie. Mm -hmm. So that was my goal. And why, and, and did you consider doing it you know in earlier years or what what was the change that made you decide now's the time too many too many years had gone by mm -hmm. uh even too many years since they reopened the case too many yeah too much time i was trying to figure out how much time it was but um <laughs> since they made robert wagner a person of interest uh too much time when they changed the autopsy report and mm -hmm. it's like these things would happen and then they would just sort of go away and nothing was being driven forward mm -hmm. as I would have liked. Right. But if I do nothing but stand up for Natalie, that's good. So what was the process of writing this book like? I mean, it must have been a difficult for you. Um, it was writing, 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 recording, recording, crying. Oh. writing, crying, writing, recording, going for a walk, crying, uh, basically over oh. and over again. I mean, I would literally just have to stop and uh, leave the room, shut everything down for a while and say, you know, I will, I will go back into this later. Wow. So it was, it was rough. I, I can imagine. And, and in the end, was it cathartic for you to write it? Do you think? Or almost <laughs> almost almost yeah fair enough fair enough um so the book came out in november um what has the reaction been to the book wonderful wonderful i've had people call me that i wouldn't have dreamed would have even remembered me um i had uh, two of of the heads of universal studios when i was working there as a uh, vice president director of development for TV films. Mm -hmm. And I got two calls and then I got a call from the man who was my direct boss who went on and on and on and on and on. And I, I just, it's been really wonderful. I mean, I, I thought if those are the only calls I got were the ones from, you know, the first week it was out, I'm good. I'm just, <laughs> that's wonderful. That's so good. it's been very pleasing and very hopeful for me. That's great. That's wonderful. Well, can you talk about your relationship with Natalie? Like how it evolved from the time when you were very young? Of course, there's a, a pretty big age gap between you. Yeah, there's eight years. But, mm -hmm. um, you know, there also comes a time when she stops being your big sister and the the space of time between us is shortened mm -hmm. you know being 20 and having a 28 year old 
sister here in the same ballpark, basically. Mm -hmm. And um, it's just we we started talking as friends and spending a lot of time together as friends, going shopping, eating out constantly, um, having people come over to her house for dinner and just silly parties. We used to play games. Um, you know, what, what friends would do, go to movies, go for walks, just get into trouble. <laughs> <laughs> well, we won't talk about that. No. no. Um, so how did, well, how did, can you tell us a little bit about how your upbringing informed Natalie's career and, you know, how things. Well, happened? our upbringing was very different. Natalie was a star on the day I was born. Mm -hmm. She was already a big child star. Um, so I was sort of placed in with Natalie, no matter what she was doing. My mom had to go to the set and she wouldn't, she didn't believe in babysitters or anything. So she would have to take me and I would miss school. Um, Natalie had an entire coterie of, of people that would watch after her. She was working all the time. She was doing dress fittings. She was doing makeup tests. She was learning lines. She was reading scripts. She was, you know, always very, very busy. Um, so I got to be the child who was not ever. I had no rules. I had, um, you know, basically no parental guidance whatsoever. And um, it, it turned out fine. I was able to get along in uh, by myself and um, wasn't too bad, but I had absolutely no, I didn't know that you were supposed to write thank you notes when people sent gifts. No, I really didn't. There were things like that. You know, I was 18 years old, had no idea, absolutely none. Um, because no, I was never involved in any of that. I was off reading a book. I was, you know, climbing trees and I always had skin and knees, always. So it was I, I different for the both of us. Yeah, I, I got the sense that not only was your upbringing different, but that you two are inherently very different people. Would you agree? Yes, I would. There's a lot, but it's very basic things where we are similar, um, but it's it's a deep down. Um, but yeah, Natalie, you know, would say that she wished she could be more free and spontaneous like I am. And I had no idea what it was to be anything but, and it never dawned on me how constricted she felt at times because she had to be a certain way. She had to look, say, do everything. Right. Everything, every word that came out of her mouth, basically, would be in print. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, she had a, a lot of constraints that I didn't have. Right. Well, your mother was really the driver for her career and really yeah. everything about her. I mean, can you talk about your mom a little bit? and, and why Sure. That um very superstitious very russian um very charming fun for flirtatious people adored her she was never thought of as a stage mother she was just there to amuse and to look after natalie um she was she was flighty uh, she was really wrapped up in Natalie's career and fought for her and pushed her and did everything to keep her on track and keep her going so that she would have a career that lasted. And um, whereas people have said, you know, what a terrible stage mother she was and how could she do this and that, she was securing a wonderful life for Natalie. She was a movie star 
she had everything she wanted at her disposal. So my mother did not look at it as doing something terrible. Um, she looked at it as she was, she was taking care of Natalie. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm torn about my mom, but uh, she did what she thought was best. Sure. That makes, I mean, that makes perfect sense. I think all parents would say the same, same. Or most yeah. parents would say the same thing. We, we think we're doing the best we can for our kids. Sure. You know? But um, so let's talk about um, Natalie. Now um, you worked alongside Natalie in Hollywood for a long time um, and worked, as we said, on films yourself. What was the culture like for women in that time? Can you talk about that a little bit? I you mean, know, I, I was sort of not a part of my age group culture at all. Um, I was with Natalie. I was with her friends at her house and we were doing whatever it is we were doing. Um, women in general didn't have a, a terrific amount of, of uh, say so. Um, I know I, I've run into people that were contract players at Fox as I was. And I was told horror stories about, you know, the casting couch. And did I ever run into this guy? This I'm like, no. First of all, nobody messed with me because I'm Natalie Wood's sister. So right there, I've got an edge and they're not going to mess with me. Uh, the one time that this assistant director who had to direct that day because um, our director was ill at on Peyton Place. Um, he pulled me down on his lap and I hit him. <laughs> and um, I got into a lot of trouble for it. Really? I was called to the executive producer's office and told that since I did this in front of the entire cast and crew, that I had to apologize. And I said, no, I most certainly will not. I, how dare he do this? So I, I wouldn't, and I, I fell out of favor on Peyton Place. Oh but I just, I, I never put up with anything. Mm -hmm. You know, if someone would suggest or do or was, I don't know, just say anything that didn't, suit me or how I felt I was gone mm -hmm. zip out of there interesting um oh so <laughs> I, I once walked home from a uh a, a club after throwing a drink in a director's face that I was out with I went out to dinner with him and I walked all the way home I said I'm going to the ladies room and I left and I walked home <laughs> and it was a long walk. Wow. <laughs> but wow. I, so I didn't really have any sort of an issue there. Mm -hmm. um, I also, I didn't go to premieres. I didn't go to big parties. I didn't go to ABC get togethers or I, I just didn't. Um, I did my work, which is what I loved. I loved to act. But when they said it's a wrap, I wanted to go home to my, my cat, my dog, my, you know, my place. And um, if I wanted to, you know, see someone, I, I would call Natalie and say, what, what are you doing tonight? I'm done. And she'd say, wow, come on over and we'll invite some people over. And we would, we would just do that. I just was not in like the, the party circuit. Mm -hmm. um, Natalie's friends were all very interesting, intelligent, fun. Um, it, was, it was terrific. So I was with an older group of people mm -hmm. and um, they didn't do drugs. We didn't do drugs. We didn't really party, drank wine. 
So um, I could go on and on about that. But. <laughs> <laughs> well, let me, let me, let me, we want to talk about some other things that you talk about in your book, obviously. Um, you do discuss in the book that Natalie confided to you that actor Kirk Douglas raped and assaulted her. Yes. And um, that was quite a revelation. And can you tell us more about that? Um, which part? Um, <laughs> when she told me it was many years later and um, we were sitting at her bar and we touched upon a subject. I don't know how it came up. I had told her something about my current husband and she didn't want to hear about it. Um, she like freaked out and we began talking about her reaction and I was questioning why and um, she said that she went on an interview and that, and she got very sort of emotional at that time. And I said, well, what happened there? And she said, he hurt me and left it at that because we didn't discuss anything sexual ever, not to our parents, not to each other. I didn't even talk to friends about anything like that. Um, we just, it never came up in our lives. And she was still very reticent to have to talk about that. Well, she was quite young, right? She was what, 15, 16 when that yeah, happened? Yeah, yeah. And, and, uh, and you talk in the book about how you were, you were in the car with your mother and Natalie and that you dropped, you know, she was dropped off to this appointment. And then, yeah. you know, when she left, she was, dressed beautifully and everything. And then when she got back in the car, she was disheveled and she was upset and you were in the back of the car and you didn't really know what was going on because you were young, no. you know? No. Um, and, you know, but your mother's reaction in retrospect must Yeah, have, that, you know, that wasn't good. But there again, you're asking about that time, a right. woman's role, that all played into it. My mom basically told her, you know, to keep her mouth shut or she'd probably never work again. And who was going to believe her over Kirk Douglas, who is a major star. And yet my, my mom had her dress up way beyond her years when she was dropped off, which I wondered about many years later. Um, but it, you know, the same thing held true with, when Natalie was a little kid and, and doing um, a film and she had to cross a bridge and it was supposed to be timed that it would collapse just as she got to the other side. Well, the timing was off and the bridge collapsed with her on it. She broke her wrist. And there again, my mom said, don't tell anybody, just, you know, bite your lip, suck it up, work otherwise, you'll never get a job again. And she was never taken to a doctor. She was never looked at and she had a broken wrist that then, you know, when it healed, the bone was a little distended and she, Natalie was really, really self-conscious about it. So it, it's right in, right in my mom's style of what she thought women should do. Right. Yeah. And of course you're right. That, that was, that was what it was back then, you know, yeah. um, but it's, it's in retrospect and looking at things from how, how they are today. Not, not that we've come a long way, but we have come part of the way. Yes. It's just yes. Appalling to think that, you know, she wouldn't have at least taken her to the doctor afterwards, yeah. you know, yeah. or, you know, I don't know. It's just, you know, it, it, when I was reading the book, I felt, I just felt so sorry for Natalie, you know, but she didn't know anything else. That was no, raised, that's you know? just it. Yeah. Yeah. So what made you decide to, to actually tell this story um, now? I mean, cause I know that Natalie did swear you to secrecy. Yes. Um, why did, why did you, um, it's okay. Because to of the entire movement now, Natalie, I wish Natalie had spoken up. I wish she were with us to mm -hmm. have spoken up because she would have. Natalie was in therapy. Natalie was turning over stones and dealing with all the little ugly frogs that came out from under. 
Uh, and she was really, you know, trying desperately to change a lot of things and understand a lot of things. And um, yeah, she would want people to know what happened. I didn't, however, feel that it was right just as he died. I was like, no, no, no. Because the press started calling me because evidently this was a rumor that was going around Hollywood. And uh, they said, would you make a statement? Would you? And I said, no, absolutely not. Well, did you know? I said, nope, don't know anything. Hang up the phone, wait for the next call. Um, that would not have been right. Mm -hmm. I, I would not. I don't like to hurt other people. Um, but I will be truthful. I may leave out things <laughs> so that I don't hurt anybody, but you know, um, the truth is too important to me and became way too important to Natalie. She really wanted to, you know, put her house in order, so to speak. Mm -hmm. Have you spoken to anybody in the Douglas family since your book came out? No. 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 <laughs> I didn't know if they, anybody would have reached out to you or. No. no, 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 no. It's better. It was said, it was cleared up and now, you know. Move, move on. on. Right, mm -hmm. exactly. Yeah. So, um, so talking again about Natalie's earlier life, um, what did you think when Natalie remarried Robert Wagner? Uh, well, <laughs> I was not happy. And I really felt that she was making a mistake. Um, I trapped her in the kitchen after she announced to me and our mom and dad, which were called together for this dinner where she had something to tell all of us. And um, I stopped her in the kitchen and I said, why are you doing this? Why are you doing this? And she said, well, because sometimes the devil you know is better than the devil you don't. Mm -hmm. And my reaction was, that's not a reason. That's not a reason to get married. It really isn't. I love him madly. I don't wanna live without him anymore. I, there are so many things that I would have accepted, but not that, not that. So I'm afraid, you know, um, a lot of the dissent that occurred was basically because of the way I reacted. Mm -hmm. I never made him a friend. I didn't really chat with RJ. I'd come and Natalie and I would go do what we had planned to do, or we would leave the house immediately and go out to eat and go out to shop all day, um, you know, anything. Um, I just, I just wasn't happy. Mm -hmm. with that situation at all so so when she passed and he basically cut you off um you think that that was the reason why i don't know uh people would ask me all the time why would he do this and i said i don't know obviously he holds a grudge <laughs> um i don't know i really don't i'm i'm being light about it but um the thing is you know, it was obvious he, he wanted to hurt me. He wanted to make sure that I couldn't go back to a, my production job, which I was loving, love, love, love producing. Um, so that I was him? That was him? That was the, he was the reason that you lost that job? Yeah, I, I, I left my uh, current employer at Warner Brothers and uh, was promised and told it was a done deal for me to go over to Hemdale. Uh, David Hemmings and I had a long meeting. Um, I had never met with Robert Daly, however. So at one point, um, David went back to London. And um, at one point I thought, boy, I, I better introduce myself to John Daly and get to know him. And I don't want him to you know, move forward on a couple of the issues that I had. And I should give him my input. And I called and he said, I have no idea what you're talking about. Mm. And I was stunned. Wow. Absolutely stunned. I mean, I had left a very nice position to go there. Um, so after I sort of 
got over that, I started making the rounds. People that I knew, um, I said, I, you know, I'd be willing to come back in as director of development. That would not bother me. I, I enjoyed that position as well. I, all these people, and I kept, you know, politely being told, ah, we don't have anything, you know, and I, it was just um, puzzling. But I had a daughter to support and take care of. So um, I worked at uh, Barney's New York in the ladies department. Um, I worked at a furniture store. I worked at a doll collectible store. Um, where else? Sprint. I used to work for Sprint. And um, it one day it dawned on me is he wanted to hurt me and keep me quiet and keep me out of the industry, but I'm still okay. I went to work doing something else and I have a little house in Thousand Oaks and my daughter is fine. And, you know, I've, I've got one grandchild and so it didn't work is how I looked at it. Interesting. Yeah. So, <laughs> I mean, there's, I say it was sad when I read that part of the book, I was feeling very, very sad about that for you, you know, because it's, it's so, un it seems so unfair, you know? Well, it was, and I did really love production. Uh, yeah. My heart was really in that yeah. um, because also doing that, you're not judged on your looks. You're not judged on, you know, anything, but mm -hmm. what, you know, Right. And that's why it appealed so much. And finding a baby and seeing it grow up all the way through casting, all the way through filming on the first day was wonderful. Mm -hmm. I just, uh, it, it really meant a lot to me. But, um, you know, as I say, I got along. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I was good. <laughs> well, we're glad. Um, now, talking about, um, I want to talk about when the case was reopened. Um, Dennis Davern, who was the captain of the um, Splendor, yes, um, basically changed his story. Um, no, he, he didn't really change it. He was saying a very tiny part that rj and rj's attorney had told him he must say so what he did was he was holding back a lot of a lot of truths and a lot of things that happened that he didn't tell anybody and wasn't but wasn't he wasn't that one of, the, one of the big drivers for the petition to reopen the case absolutely absolutely and then you had two detectives come to your house Mm -hmm. Right. And so constantly, <laughs> they were <laughs> lovely. I really, I really have so much respect for the homicide division. I, I mean, these guys are terrific and uh, really work hard. So would, is it safe to say that you absolutely know that the case was mishandled initially? I Based believe what you it know was. now. <laughs> I believe it was. Yeah, very. Yeah. It's the same thing. This is not a big shock. It's the same thing that happens all the time. Oh, he got off. He's not being punished or the, well, he's, you know, whoever. He's the head of Warner Brothers Studios. He's a big star in Thailand. He's, I, it, it always happens. The people with power and money get off. They're not, they're not um, having to pay mm -hmm. for what they've done, which is a shame, but it's something that has always gone on. And I imagine it will continue to. Sadly, I yeah. have to agree with that. Yeah. Um, but you did eventually hitch up with a, a former detective that you call Frank in the book. Yes. And wasn't he really the person who really opened your eyes to 
to the, what really happened on the boat. And I mean, certainly what Dennis said did also, but you know, the mishandling of the case, everything. It wasn't um, driver no, said. he just sort of filled in a lot of blanks okay. and was really able to help um, and unravel the truth that was covered up. But by then I had known everything that Dennis had said. And mm -hmm. also Dennis had said to me one night when he was talking to me, he said, it was terrible. He, they were fighting. They were, I don't know. And then he would say, I can't, I can't tell you anymore because you're, you're going to get really upset. And he would hang up the phone. Oh. And so I, it was really a nightmare for him. It was horrible to have to live with that. I don't know how he did. I really don't because that's, uh, uh, don't even want to think about it. I yeah. really, I really feel very badly for Dennis. Yeah, I, I think when reading the book, I would, I would say you can't help but feel sorry for the man, you know? Yeah. For, for what you, you know, and the fact that he kept it to himself for so long, you know, before he reached out or, you know, told anybody, but yeah, um, yeah, it's really very interesting, very fascinating. The whole book it really is. Thank um, you. When you, when you think about the, um, let me rephrase that. Do you think that the investigation into Natalie's death, the original one, such as it was, <laughs> um, do you think that it would be done differently if this happened today? Without question, without no hesitancy on my part with that. Oh yeah, completely different. And do you think that, um, I mean, what, I guess what's going on now? Is there anything going on with it now? Is it just? Not to my knowledge, there yeah. isn't. You know, the last time I spoke with um, uh, Detective Hernandez, with Ralph Hernandez, um, he said it was one of the things that just eats away at him and Kevin Lowe, who was mm -hmm. his partner when they first began. Um, I don't know that there is anything more going on, but I hope I'm wrong. Yeah. Well, Robert Jet Wagner is what, 91 now? I think I looked him up. Um, so <laughs> I don't know what he's going to do, but it's, it's just. It's just so frustrating. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. Other, I know you didn't mean it this way, but people, more than one, have said to me, well, but isn't it best just to forget it? I mean, he's 91 years old. And I said, oh, so age allows you to get away with whatever it is you did wrong. That's an interesting concept. I'll have to remember that since I'm aging rapidly, <laughs> but I don't think that makes it okay or no. forgivable for anyone ever. No, and I meant the opposite. You know, I was thinking more along the lines of he probably isn't going to be around too much longer for them to, uh, to indicting him for this. You know, it so. still needs to be said. Yeah. You know, yeah. the truth has got it's it still needs to be said. Mm -hmm. You know, Natalie wasn't a drunk. Natalie wasn't pill taker yes she took um a pill to go to sleep always forever yeah she got seasick so she would take dramamine or whatever you know was necessary mm -hmm. um and i just wish all that would stop there's mm -hmm. so much of that and i, I it's ludicrous it's yeah. absolutely ludicrous and i will not sit quietly and have anybody talk about Natalie that way. Good for you. Natalie, Natalie should be very proud of you, I think, <laughs> doing this for her. One thing that, I, yeah. that I, I, I did want to mention, and I kind of forgot about it, but, um, when they were on the Splendor the night that she um, ended, the night before, um, Robert Wagner said that she um, just took off in the dinghy. Right. And and in actual fact, you say in your book that Natalie was, first of all, petrified of the water. And second of all, that she was in a nightgown and slippers and she would never go out dressed like that. Right. Of course not. Yeah. No, no so, never. Where did this fear of water 
come from? I mean, obviously she wasn't a swimmer. It was, no, she was not. Um, it was particularly dark water too. Okay. Um, she even talked about it on, on various talk shows that she did. She admitted that that was her great fear. Um, I remember when I was a kid, my mom sitting Natalie and I down and telling our fortunes. So my mother, as I said before, was very superstitious. My mother also claimed that she was raised in China and that she met a gypsy there who said to her, you will have a child that will be known around the world, very famous, very well loved, but she sees somebody was going to drown in dark water. Wow. Thank you. So your mother told this story to Natalie. Over and over and over again. And then would go continue telling our fortunes. Okay. So I, <laughs> sometimes I think common sense leaves us all. Yeah. So, um, yeah, that was not a good thing to perpetrate. Sorry, perpetrate. Not, um, but it's quite possible that it began there. But my mother also didn't know how to swim and wouldn't. Mm -hmm. So uh, I don't know, because I'm a certified scuba diver. <laughs> so uh, it's, it was that side of the family. <laughs> I don't know. I never believed a word my mom said as oh. far as uh, her fortune telling. I would yeah. sit and listen very dutifully and then go, hey, great, thank you. And she'd say, oh no, you can never thank me. Otherwise it won't come true. And I went, ah, oh, yeah, maybe next time. Oh gosh. But <laughs> I, we do have a couple of questions from patrons that I, I, okay. I won't have time for. Um, Catherine asks, were you instrumental in reopening the case about your sister's death? Um, only that I was the first signer of, of the petition. But and so I'd like to think that I helped a little bit, but it wasn't it wasn't me that began the petition, but it was wonderful when it happened. I bet. I bet. OK. And then another question um, unrelated from Robin. Do you still have the children's stories you wrote and would you consider publishing them today? I wish I did. Um, all the stories that I've written in the past 15 years would never be published as children's books. I wish I did, but um, <laughs> you don't even have no. you don't even have them. Yeah, to re you don't even have them to rework them. Yeah. No, okay. no. Okay, and I think we know the answer to this one. But Vicky said, "What is your relationship now with Robert Wagner?" What relationship? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> don't have one. And, and then there's another question. Um, is a petition needed to reopen a case? That's a very good question. Um, perhaps it does. It certainly was in this case, the attorney that began the petition and wanted the case reopened felt that uh, he contacted Marty Ruley who is a dear friend of Dennis DeVerns. So um, Marty got involved because he felt that she could further what he wants since she knew so many people and, uh, and was a friend of Dennis's. So he at one point said, okay, here's, here's everything, turned it over to her and said, get as many names as you can. So she did that, you know, Marty worked tirelessly and I'm very grateful to her. Um, so I want to let our patrons know that we just have a few more minutes so if anybody has any other questions they want to ask please get them typed in and meanwhile um, a different topic um, have you seen the new West Side Story movie and um, what do you think? <laughs> I haven't seen it. Um, I, haven't. I really try to stay in as much as humanly possible. Um, I've got, you know, I've got kids that live with me and, and I'm certainly at my age, 
Um, I don't need to be getting sick. That would be a bad thing. So I haven't really gone anywhere. The, uh, the only time I can see anything is when uh, the Motion Picture Academy sends them to my computer and then I can watch them on the computer. And I do believe they have uh, offered West Side Story, but I feel like there's so much to see. And a part of me isn't sure if I want to see it. That was my next question is do you yeah. want to see it? Yeah. I don't know. I don't I don't know. Well, I, I, as much as I love the first version, I have to honestly say I was really surprised at how much I liked the new one. Really? It's different. It's, oh, that's it's wonderful. Done, it's different. It's different. I mean, the basic story is the same, but it's different enough that I wasn't thinking about, oh, well, she's not doing as well as Natalie did or I got you know, you. those types of things. So, right. So, you know, if you get in the mindset of this is a different movie, if you can do that. Anyway, yeah, yeah. That's neither here nor there. Um, back to some new patron questions real quick. How did your parents feel about um, Wagner? Robert Wagner. Um, my father never really said a word one way or the other. Um, my dad was a, uh, a book reader. Uh, I got my love of books from him. Um, and my mother if anybody was involved in the motion picture industry, they were gods. So my mother just absolutely worshiped the ground he walked on. So she, so you could, you probably couldn't really talk with her about him then. <laughs> I wouldn't have anyway, okay. you know, why, why sure. begin an issue of some sort and That's create true. any kind of animosity. So I wouldn't do it. Understood. Um, do you have a relationship with Natalie's daughters? I don't. I don't. They um, they may I, they never answered phone calls or letters or anything. So That's I just sad. wish them well. I, I keep, you know, every once in a while somewhere I'll go, you know, you know, this is your birthday. I love you. But, uh, you know, I, I, it's it's too difficult. It's too difficult because if you think about it all either one of them know about their mom is either what they've seen on the screen or what their dad has told them. Sure. They didn't grow up with her. And even if they had, Natalie would not have shared any kind of intimate stories with them ever. You know, um, she was super mom, Natalie. She loved those kids and read every book she could on child rearing it was she was very very into her motherhood mm. so that's sadly shame. none that's a shame i it is I, I i sense that you would be a very fun aunt and they're they're missing out oh <laughs> um, well no. so um alice asks says your dog is adorable what's his name <laughs> <laughs> which one oh i, I don't know <laughs> which Oh, that's Veronica sleeping on the pillow. That's oh, Veronica. Yeah, Veronica, okay. Um, my butt warmer dog is, uh, I have no idea, but he's scruffy and name is Bean. Um, who else is here? Oh, my ancient dog. Okay, Peanut is oh, oh, my peanut. ancient dog I see, over the, there. See, I see Peanut's little head popping up. <laughs> I know, poor baby. He's so old. Aww. And I bothered his nap, but anyway. Oh, well, I'm, I'm sorry. Tell him we're about done. So <laughs> okay. let him go back to sleep. Go back to sleep. Yeah. Uh, real, real quick, because I promised I would bring this up and I wanted to, I want to do that. You, you mentioned to me before we started about a new project. Can you share that? Yes. Yes. I'm going to be making a film uh, called Oh my God. What was it? Good dog boy. dog boy. That was it. Thank you. I'm like, good. I wrote it down. <laughs> not it. All of a sudden I just, yeah. Dog boy. And um, it's being produced by winter film productions. And um, it's a great story. It's one, it's, it's really wonderful. It says a lot about the, uh, some of the, the sadness with the American Indian, um, it's just, it's, it's going to be really good. I shoot Monument Valley where I shot the searchers. Oh, so how I'm exciting. going back there, which is great. 
And is, is it, do you, I, I suppose it's too soon to know a release date or anything for this. Oh yeah, haven't yeah. shot a, a foot of film yet. Okay, so we'll just have to put it on our calendar for next year maybe. <laughs> I wish, I, let's yeah. hope. Yeah. Let's hope. Let's hope, all right. Well, Lana, it's just been an absolute delight to meet you, to talk with you tonight. Um, I thank all our patrons who have been watching and joined us tonight. And I thank you, your book again, um, Little Sister, if you haven't read it, it's, it's, uh, it's worth your time. It's out now. So um, Learn It Owl here in Hudson is selling it. There's a link in the chat if you wanna do that or wherever you get your books, even libraries. <laughs> <laughs> yes. so um anyway we're, we're we're about done for tonight thank you lana and thank you thank you i appreciate our, it our pleasure and have a good night everyone you good night too. good night